Okay, welcome back. So uh, last time we chatted, we um, we were looking at the, the question of uh, do you believe in evolution? And I asked a couple of silly questions like do you believe in the color blue? Uh, to get to the point that um, that belief in anything is really not what we're after in, in the sciences and definitely not in biology. Um, so let's look at kind of the theory of evolution uh, really quickly to start with here. And then we'll look at um, some of the consequences of theory of evolution by natural selection and finish up looking at some classification uh, stuff uh, okay so before you get going watching this video uh, which I'm going to try and keep to 12 to 14 minutes today um, read the article nothing makes sense in biology which is in canvas in the week one module and uh, that'll help you put um, some of this into context of, um, of why we should really start a discussion of general biology one with the discussion of evolution. Um, so that being said, let's kind of crack on. Okay, so uh, the theory of natural selection according to, sorry, the theory of evolution according to natural selection has really brought to us courtesy of um, Charles Darwin and a man called Wallace. Now Wallace isn't usually credited um, with, uh, with the theory of evolution according to natural selection, but he did indeed make as many contributions as Darwin. It's just Darwin published it first. Um, Wallace had the same ideas and the same um, speculations at the same time as Darwin. So for evolution according to natural selection to occur, three things have to happen. First of all, you've got to have variation in the population. So in this population of giraffes here, there's some with tall necks, short necks, not quite as short necks, not quite as tall necks, a lot of variation. Second thing you gotta have is um, is not all of those variants reproducing as effectively. And in biology we call that fitness. So if I produce more children than you do over the course of my lifespan, I'm fitter biologically than you would be. And so these giraffes, the ones with the long necks, the longest necks can reach high to the top top of the trees and pluck all the leaves, and if you've got a shorter neck, like the little, little dead giraffe on the ground, then you're not going to be able to reach those leaves, and if you can't feed, then you certainly are going to get to reproductive age, and you're not going to leave offspring in the environment. And that means you're not passing your genes on. And lastly, you need um, an environment which cannot sustain unlimited growth. Now, this is actually a principle from um, from mathematics and from an economist called Malthus, and Darwin and Wallace borrowed this idea. So. There are these three things, and when these three things all work together, is, is what we get is not survival of the fittest per se, but rather death of the weak. And so if you're not fit enough, um, you won't leave offspring in the uh, population and you won't pass your genes on. So that's that's kind of the theory of evolution according to Darwin and Wallace. And let's look at, at an earlier theory, uh, which is uh, still kicked around and worth hearing about, um, but know that this is wrong at least in the context I'm going to tell you about it here. So Lamarck suggested before Darwin and Wallace that during the lifetime of this ancestral giraffe here on the left, um, it had a short neck, uh, but during its life it stretched and stretched and stretched and its neck got a little bit longer and it passed on that long neck to its offspring. And, and on this point, Darwin and Wallace, uh, Darwin and Wallace and Lamarck agreed. And what they agreed on is that characteristics must be transmitted from parent to offspring. And so Darwin and Lamarck agree on the idea that that um, characteristics must be passed on from generation to generation, and we now know that to be obviously in the case uh, in the form of genes. Um, but Lamarck was wrong um, on the count of believing that. Um, characteristics acquired during the lifespan of an organism can be passed on to the offspring. So this is much like us expecting that my children uh, would have the same knowledge and skills that I've acquired through um, uh, two degrees and a number of years working in, in education. And obviously that's not, not going to be the case. So um, let's return to, um, to evolution according to Darwin and Wallace. Um, and I'm talking only here about natural selection. I'm not really talking about the other forms of, uh, the other mechanisms by which evolution can occur. You'll get to those in general biology too. So um, there are two main ways in which evolution can occur, generally speaking. Um, first one is called vertical evolution. This is where um, you and I pass our genes to our children. 
and our children pass the genes on to their children. And with each passing generation, the frequency of the gene variants, which are called alleles, um, changes. And once enough changes occur and populations become isolated, how is it possible that new species may form? So there's vertical evolution. On the other hand, there is horizontal evolution, and this is as important as vertical evolution, which you're more familiar with. So in horizontal evolution, species one can pass its um, genes onto a different species. Now this has happened all the time. It's happened today. Um, if a antibiotic resistant bacteria releases a piece of DNA into the environment, which is picked up by a different species of bacteria, possibly a pathogenic species of bacteria, then that bacteria can become antibiotic resistance and uh, resistant, and that's obviously not a good thing. So two general ways that evolution occurs. Now if we look at this in the context of a um, specific example, make it a bit more concrete, um, let's look at um, horse evolution. And so I'm going to just move my mouse onto the slide and I'm going to look off of our camera because I'm, I'm looking at a slide on a different computer now. So I've got a little diagram here for vertical evolution and like we just said, generation one passes its genes to generation two. Generation 2 passes its genes to generation 3, and over time, variations of those genes accumulate and uh, frequencies of those variants change, and um, maybe populations get divided, and ultimately, maybe new species form. And so, if we look at the example here of vertical evolution in, in horses, uh, down here at the bottom, Heracotherium, this is the ancestral horse. Um, and this was some 54, 55 million years ago. And over time, there were genetic changes in, in, that, in that species until at some point, two new species were formed. And those two species are extinct, Orohippus and then this lineage over to the left. Then Orohippus split to give us Ephippus. Um, and then Orohippus went on to produce a number of other lineages. And we can trace these lineages all the way up to the modern uh, extant that means living, the modern extent horse equus. Um, and so over time, genes have changed in terms of their structure, frequencies of, of, of variations of genes have changed, um, populations have split and become divided, and, and we've seen a gradual change in the horse form um, from the original Heracotherium species to the new modern equus. And that doesn't mean that equus is any better um, than uh, Heracotherium, it's just uh, adapted to the environment which we find today. So um, there's a concrete example of vertical evolution. Let's look at uh, horizontal evolution. This has happened frequently and it's happening all the time. Um, two major events uh, involving horizontal evolution. Let's start again on this other, on this bottom dark blue line here. This is one of the major events. Um, that is the the event which led to the formation of what we call today mitochondria. So what happened there is that um, one ancestral bacterium engulfed another and one became symbiotic, and he's living in kind of harmony with its partner and, um, and eventually gave rise to, to the modern day mitochondria. And the same thing happened up here when one bacterium engulfed another and the, the bacterium that was engulfed was a photosynthetic bacterium and that gave rise today to what we call uh, the chloroplast. And so those are two major events of endosymbiosis, and they are examples of horizontal gene transfer. It's happened numerous times uh, within the bacteria, between the bacteria and the archaebacteria, and between bacteria and eukarya, and archaebacteria and eukarya for that matter. Um, and so that's given us a lot of um, the diversity that we see. And so that's my, my next point. All of this um, descent with modification over time leads to a huge amount of diversity on planet Earth. Um, for example, we have a little shrew here with a, with a limb, and there was probably an ancestor of the shrew had an even more ancestral limb. But, but over time, evolution has given us diversification to the bat wing or to, for example, the dolphin flipper. So the structures in purple here are also seen in the bat wing and in the dolphin flipper. And in green, that structure is preserved in the bat wing and the dolphin flipper. And so over time, although there have been changes, there have been modifications, um, uh, we're seeing some unity. We're seeing the same or similar structures being used in similar ways, but in different forms. And so what we get is we get uh, 
a huge diversity of forms of life on, on, on the planet. Um, and the theories of evolution really allow us to explain this diversity and they also help us understand why all life is unified. And we'll get to the point of unification um, in our next slide right here. So here is a very, very general uh, classification of, um, of the three major or three uh, domains of life, the bacteria, the archaebacteria, and the eukaryota. Um, and so before we talk about classification, let's take a look at the unification aspect um, of unity and diversity. So down here, right at the bottom of this, what's called the root of this tree of life, down there, that was an ancestral organism, probably the first living thing on planet Earth. That was the first living thing that is ancestral to all of the other life forms that are extant and extinct, so living and no longer with us. And so if we trace from this ancestor down here, genetic changes occurred and, and that, that organism and that species changed a little bit until this point here where there was enough diversification that the, the, the two major groups were recognized. And the two major groups were this left arm here, which ended up being the bacteria over on the left, and then this branch here, which is the archaea and the eukaryota. And so this div divergence into two major groups down here tells us that the archaebacteria and the eukaryota are more closely related than um, the archaebacteria and the bacteria or the eukaryota and the bacteria. Um, because the eukaryota and the archaea share a common ancestor here, whereas the archaebacteria and the bacteria share a common ancestor down here. So um, let's, let's just trace um, up into the eukaryota, which we're familiar with. So there was a, an event here which gave us the two major groups of the archaea and the eukaryota versus the bacteria. And then at this point here, there was another split, and that gave rise to the eukaryota up here. Let me back up a slide. So the eukaryota, um, so the archaeobacteria up here and the eukaryota up here. So let's follow the eukaryota lines. Another major event here, which split two into two groups, and then another one here, and another one here. And so we're in this group here, the animalia. And so over time, we've seen this between this point here and the animalia here, we've seen a huge diversification that gave us the complexity that we see in the animals. And you can do the same thing looking up through the tree in terms of bacteria. So is what we have is unity. We are all derived from a common universal ancestor. That's called the last universal common ancestor or LUCA. And so that's common to all of us, whether we're a bacteria, an archaeobacteria, a plant, a fungus, an animal. It doesn't matter. We will share this last universal common ancestor as our ancestor. And so we get all this diversity um, from descent with modification and, and that requires classification. That means we've got to put things in groups and, and here we're putting things in groups based on evolutionary relationships and that is probably the best way to do it. So let's look at the most conventional way that that is done. Um, so we just talked a little about domains. Those are the, the uh, the archaeobacteria, the bacteria, and the eukarya, and here we're just looking at the eukarya at the top here. And you can see that there are about, I don't know, five million different species, not obviously all shown here, but five million different species. And then as we go down to the next group, the supergroup, the opistoconta, there are about a million of those, and that million is contained within this five million. And then we go down the kingdom, phylum, class, order, so let's stop at order. So if we see these four fish here in this order, and we get into the next group, the family. These three fishes are more closely related to one another than they are to this one here, this like lamprey looking fish. And so then these four are more closely related to one another than they are to this kind of skate looking type fish. So let's go back down and get all the way down to the level of the species. So if you think about a species, in a species, the individuals are all more related to one another than they are to any other species. So that's the easiest place to think about this if you have trouble with unification. If you think about one species, think about Homo sapiens. We're all more related to one another than we are to 
any other species. So go and pick anything you like, a fish. We're all more related to one another. You are more related to me than either of us are to a fish or a penguin or a peacock or anything you want to pick, a bacteria, it doesn't matter. So what we get is we get this idea of um, evolution being the main unifying concept in biology. And we've got the ideas of Darwin, um, which superseded the... Uh, which, which came after the, the ideas of Lamarck. And then we have the idea that descent with modification uh, gives us this great diversity we see, but we're all unified by our descent from a common ancestor. And then we have this idea that we must all classify, we must classify all life um, in a hierarchical way, and that's best done by evolutionary relationships. Okay, so that's it for now.